Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode of this podcast, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historic context in which they occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, we will discuss the recent Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. Recently, over 500 people were killed as a result of an uh, Al Ali Arab hospital bombing in Gaza, and the U.S. has provided Ukraine long-range attackums missiles. For insight into this, let's turn to my guest. He's a Moscow-based international relations and security analyst, Mark Schloboda. Mark, let's connect some dots. Pleasure to be on connecting the dots. So Russian President Putin recently went to Beijing to participate in the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. Uh, Mark, how significant was this meeting? Yeah, um, so I think that this meeting was significant for uh, a number of reasons. Um, first, for President Putin uh, on, on uh, a personal situation, it is the first time that he has left Russia uh, since uh, the West pushed International Criminal Court charged Vladimir Putin with the crime of helping uh, families and caretakers in East Ukraine move their own children out of the range of Kiev regime artillery that had been bombing them for the last 10 years. Uh, also known as abducting children, which evidently is a crime when uh, Russia does it in a time of conflict, but is not a crime when the U.S. does it when they move thousands of children out of Afghanistan and many thousands of children out of Vietnam uh, in, in a previous generation of, of, of conflict. Um, but uh, besides that, um, the Russian-Chinese relationship uh, bilaterally, I think is probably the most important bilateral relationship for both countries. And both presidents uh, seem to have a good working uh, relationship, often described as a friendship and a deep understanding with each other. And each time one of the others has been uh, reelected to their positions, the first country that they go to is each other's. Right. And I think that is a, a, a symbolic a sign of of uh, the relationship, how important it is uh, with each other's countries. But in a, in a wider perspective, this Belt and Road uh, Forum uh, Summit, it is actually the 10th anniversary of China's launching of the Belt uh, and Road Project, with, with the goal of which is to build deep infrastructure uh, all along certain geographic uh, pathways uh, uh, along a lot of what could have been considered the old Silk Road uh, to facilitate trade and connections uh, between the countries of this part of the world. And this is something that China does wherever it goes and does business is build infrastructure. Because it builds, it, it considers, you know, uh, that as a, a long term investment, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the process of conducting trade, but of the, helping their trade partner develop to a level where they can better trade with each other. Uh, so, uh, physical infrastructure, but also, you know, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, uh, things like this. Um, now, um, a lot of uh, Russian and Chinese and, and many other countries' leaders have done a lot about talking about the construction of a new, more multipolar, fairer, and more equitable world order. 
and and this would stand i think in uh contradiction and and in obvious opposition to the current uh quote unquote uh rules based orders we make the rules we give the orders of us led western global hegemony uh but uh in this emerging shall we say nascent being born multipolar world order there there are uh, you know several countries that come to the fore as as the first among equals uh, but uh, certainly China and Russia are our foremost political drivers uh, amongst that. And China stands, of course, head uh, above the rest, if only in terms of their uh, population and their economic strength, which mm -hmm. by uh, many measures already exceeds that of the United States. And if there is a meeting and a display of this alternate world order of which China is playing such an important part, a China-centric world order, if you want to call it, that was on display in this Belt and, and Road Summit. It was a bringing together uh, of all the countries participating in this physical implementation of a more multipolar world order uh the only western leader in attendance very interestingly was is the right wing prime minister of hungary uh the the foreign policy black sheep victor <laughs> orban who has uh, refused uh to participate uh in the west's uh uh proxy war in ukraine and its existential economic war of sanctions weaponizing its control of the global uh financial and economic architecture against russia um primarily from a hungarian national interest perspective rather than any great love of of uh, russia or the russian president um, which is, is I think, a position that, that most people would agree is something that should uh, be something that every world leader should aspire to, that they put their own nation's interest uh, and people above all others. Mm -hmm. Although uh, in the current world, that's not even specific. That's not, we know that is right. not the case. Just asked Olaf Scholz in Germany that question. Uh, yeah. You know, you you mentioned you mentioned uh, each time Xi and Putin get elected, we keep hearing from Western narrative, particularly from Biden, authoritarians, authoritarians. Xi is an authoritarian. Putin is an authoritarian. Uh, can just briefly explain the fact that they they're elected. They don't control their elections. They have different electoral processes than we do. They have different democratic constructs than we have. But that doesn't mean that they're authoritarian. Yeah, I mean, this is a label that is uh, tapped on essentially to any country now that lies outside of U.S.-led Western global hegemony that does not uh, align itself and does uh, not meet the you know the West's self-reflective standard of of what democracy looks like and it, it really it is a way of exerting moral superiority the idea that we are both morally and systemically superior than those people over there who are our adversaries. In a different time, it was communists, of course. Mm -hmm. And there have been uh, other uh, labels in history. And, and certainly labels are applied to the Western countries. They are imperialists. They are hegemonists. This is a, a standard othering device. Mm -hmm. um, I, I live in Russia. I, I immigrated to Russia from the United States. Uh, and uh, I have lived here for for most of two decades. Um, and I I have to be honest, um, after having some experience as a volunteer uh, for the U.S. Democratic Party, I find that politics in Russia on a whole 
is no more or less substantive uh, than, uh, you know, the democratic nature beneath the sheets of of politics in the United States. I, I don't, I don't want to go out of the way to make it seem like it's a, a democratic, you know, uh, utopia or anything like that, far mm-hmm. from it. But on a whole, knowing the warts inside and out of political systems in U.S. and Europe and now Russia, I, I, I think that uh, over in a general context that they're expressed, uh, you know, mm-hmm. themselves uh, roughly equally. Um there is uh, oh, plus, plus they plus they also they also reflect the intricacies of their cultures. Yes. And so I, I was having a conversation with some folks a couple of days ago, and I said, you know, they were, talking, oh well, G is a is an authoritarian, and you know, and I said, well, I've seen polls from from Harvard and Princeton and and some other Western universities that show like ninety six percent of Chinese people like their government. And I think it was 87% of Russians polled like their government, support their government. So if it's working for them, then who in the world am I to say that it's not good, it's not right, or what we have is better? Uh, I I know Joe Biden would love to see 60% approval rating, let alone 96% approval rating. Yeah, um, I I think not only uh, approval of the current government, but I've seen uh, similar polls uh, that uh, asking uh, peoples of of different countries whether they think they live in a democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, 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 quite overwhelmingly, you know, know, certainly over the 50 percent margin, the people of Russia feel they live in a democracy. Uh, and certainly the people in China do as well uh, to an even greater degree. It, again, it doesn't look like uh, Western uh, liberal democracy, uh, but uh, it, it, it perhaps you could consider it of a more technocratic, bureaucratic nature. But as you point out, there is a thousand, uh, you know, multi-thousand year history of, of um, uh, uh, Chinese bureaucratic uh, constructs uh, that they are laying there future uh, and their choices uh, on top of. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, in the United States, people generally feel that they don't live in a democratic system, that their government is not responsive to their needs and interests. And you could say that that is, oh, I mean, all the people in Russia and China are ignorant. They don't know the real situation of what they live and what we live in. And I got to tell you, Russian people, even Chinese people, despite the great Chinese firewall, you know, their their mm-hmm. uh, cordon of the Internet generally have a a far higher degree of uh, reading and understanding Western media than the other way around. That is, <laughs> they hear our perspective and thoughts, but. As as uh, Westerners, you quite often don't hear, uh, at, at least on your own media, unless you go actively looking for it, the opinions uh, and perspectives uh, of other countries. So uh, I think that 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 assumption that that you know all the people over in that other part of the world they don't live in a real democracy and that they think they do is only a sign of how brainwashed and ignorant they are compared to us enlightened people on the shining city on the hill that is a hallmark of the supremacist ideology of exceptionalism that unfortunately has has come to dominate not only American political culture, but I think far more important, the American political elite, uh, the ruling class. And that has disastrous consequences for U.S. foreign policy and and the world. You are absolutely right. I was uh, I've I've been to Iran twice and was uh, very blessed to uh, lecture at probably somewhere between 10 and 15 universities throughout the country. And as I traveled throughout Iran, I was amazed at how well informed the questions that these students asked me, they were they were right on it, man, in, in terms of um, 
a, a, an understanding of the of the politics of the moment. And the, again, the questions that they asked me were were spot on. It indicated that uh, they were going beyond the rhetoric. They were going beyond the talking points. And and uh, it, it was shocking to me how well informed, in spite of the wall that you talk about in terms of um, in terms of the internet, they were on they were on point, man. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that this label is applied to adversaries like mm -hmm. Russia and China. Uh, you know, Russia, which which has opposition parties and elections, they don't do very good right now because. Since the economic catastrophe of the 90s, I think the Russian population has been more united in their political vision of a path out of that and forward and, and retaking what they see as, as a, you know, their place uh, in the world, you mm -hmm. know, after the, the self-dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, that will not last forever. Right. And and a lot of people question whether it will last after Putin uh, at all. Uh, you know, but th there is, uh, you know, opposition uh, political structures. The biggest opposition political party in Russia is the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, uh, you know, uh, which uh, polls, you know, uh, generally uh, somewhere around 15 percent of the population. Uh, but um, and and in foreign policy, it must be said they they largely uh, agree with uh, the current uh, uh, government of, of of Vladimir Putin. But in domestic issues, they constantly fight for the Duma for things that leftist parties always fight for um, for uh, you know more social benefits, more spending on education and medicine and other things and. If anything, I think probably the communists would probably, if they were uh, uh, leading the country, would probably take a more hardline foreign policy uh, position than, than the current government. Um, I think that when the wait, U.S. Wait, applies wait, these... Wait, wait, speak, 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 uh, speak to that, because yeah. a lot of people listening to this will say, wait a minute, a harder line than Vladimir Putin? Oh, my God, you can't get any more... You can't get a harder line than that when the people making those observations have never listened to the man, have never read it, any of the speeches that he's given. And so they again, he's evil. He's he's uh, uh, he's he's insane. You know, all of these. He's a dictator. All of these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, again, the fact that they don't hear what Vladimir Putin has to say for himself, because the Western media specifically does not reproduce it for them. And I have to say that Russian media does this. I mean, there are still government funded projects in SOMI that translate word for word Western articles in uh, uh, print media and, uh, you know, televised and put it out there for Russians to listen to, not only from the United States and Europe, but but from all over the world that that tradition doesn't exist on the West. It's not that it is, you know, uh, banned, although in some cases in Europe, RT and Sputnik are banned, uh, aren't they? Uh, or, or uh, mm -hmm. you know, everything is done to take them off the airwaves as, as is done in the United States. And of course, not just with RT and Sputnik, but now with um, uh, press TV from Iran. Uh, and there are calls, of course, to do the same to uh, the Chinese CCTV and, and now even Al Jazeera in the current climate, uh, because uh, as the uh, state media arm of uh, Qatar, they are now seen as as being uh, anti-Israeli. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a very similar phenomenon is is now taking place. And, and in a, a previous conflict, there was very much the same argument being made about Al Jazeera over the situation in Iraq. So this rears its head mm -hmm. uh, regularly. Um, but why is the authoritarian label not linked to actual authoritarian <laughs> countries? That is dictatorships that are politically, geopolitically allied with the United States. Right. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, 
these are, are states that are starting to diversify their foreign policy, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Saudi joining BRICS and uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a dialogue partner and identifying China as their most important trade partner. But still, they, they are very much linked to the United States, and certainly they have been for decades. Uh, Qatar has uh, a giant uh, U.S. Uh, army base, uh, similarly, uh, in in Kuwait, uh, the UAE, why are the actual monarchic, uh, uh, oligarchic dictators of these countries not referred to as authoritarian? Because the label is more about is more about oppositional geopolitical alignment than it is uh, in domestic any domestic government leadership. Yeah any real assessment of their domestic political system. And I have I mean, to say... MBS is chopping heads. Yeah. I mean, literally. As, as a chopping better... It, chopping more than heads. These, <laughs> these bones are... <laughs> right. Right. Um, as as a, a veteran... Well, I'm, I'm both a military, a U.S. military veteran, and shall we say a veteran of the U.S. political system. With the all the warts that the U.S., political system has with its systemic uh, suppression of third party movements. And I'm talking, I mean, Americans don't even know this for the most part that, but their own two parties of power, the Republicans and Democrats regularly sue third, par third parties to keep them off the ballot. Right. I mean, they, they regularly go to court every election cycle to keep them off the ballot. And, you know, the, the whole structure of 50 uh, separate elections uh, and uh, the intricacies run by the party in power, either the Republicans or the Democrats in the state, does everything possible to prevent the emergence of any other voice than those, those two. And the Electoral College and the eternal problems with uh, campaign finance and lobbying but Americans somehow feel their political systemic superiority so strongly that they don't even think when their political and media elites judge the political system of another country. And, and as far as most Americans reflexively are concerned, they think they are the only democratic country on earth and the only good people, which is really kind of another iteration of we are the chosen people of God political meme throughout history. What is more authoritarian than not having a presidential primary in a system that is based on primaries? What is more of a dictatorship than imposing Joe Biden upon Democrats instead of holding a primary? I look at what look at what the Democrats did to Bernie Sanders during the Hillary Clinton campaign. Uh, hence Julian Assange's email leaks, which demonstrated all the machinations that the Clinton campaign went through to see to it that Bernie Sanders could not uh, become the Democrat nominee. What is more authoritarian than that? I, I got to tell you. Um, a am I right? Yeah, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and I don't want to go too much myself I, into U.S. domestic politics because I, I just raised that as examples. myself from that. I don't want to cast stones. I don't necessarily sure. okay. feel that it's my place to. But I'm actually a confession. I'm I'm originally from uh, Scranton, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. That's where I was born, anyway. Mm -hmm. That's also Joe Biden's hometown, mm -hmm. <laughs> where he was born. And um, I I distinctly remember the video. I mean, I was too young at the time to remember it politically, of course. But I've seen the videos of Joe Biden um, uh, running. Uh, for uh, um, uh, Congress uh, um, admitting open right that uh, the system is corrupt, that corrupt people are elected to office, and that at the time the only reason he wasn't corrupt is 
is because uh, he wasn't given the money by the, you know, the oligarchs, by the, uh, you know, the rich uh, of the country that he had asked for because he was too untested of yet. But that if he was, he would have taken. I mean, that I, I think there is no greater condemnation uh, of of the U.S. political system than admissions like that coming from the very, uh, you know, uh, seat of the president. Or, I mean, shall we take the words of prior presidents, Jimmy Carter coming right out and saying, America is no longer a democracy, it is an oligarchy. You mentioned that President Putin went to China for uh, for the conference and that this was the first time that he had left the country in, in quite a while. That, to me, uh, speaks volumes in how comfortable he must be in the midst of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. His country is at war, and he feels comfortable enough to leave his country, go to China for a couple of days. Uh, That, to me, says that he's comfortable not only in his position domestically, but he's also comfortable in his country's position internationally. Yeah, um, I, I I don't think uh, Putin does. Uh, he, he perfectly understands, I think, as a leader, what he knows and what he doesn't know. And he has made it quite clear that he does not micromanage his generals uh, in in the conflict and you know, in the intervention, the special military operation, uh, as they call it, uh, in Ukraine, the intervention in the Ukrainian civil conflict that uh, has been going on for a decade. Also, of course, neither Russia nor China, nor it must be said, or the United States or India are uh, um, uh, part our uh, signatories to the Rome statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, so uh, that is is not an issue uh, on the trip. In fact, when uh, the International Criminal Court tried to bring charges against the U.S., uh, U.S. leaders uh, and military leaders for crimes, uh, 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 alleged Again, crime, uh, yeah, committed in Afghanistan and Iraq, they they sanctioned the court. They sanctioned the judges. They they sanctioned the prosecutor. Uh, they threatened to remove funding from the, uh, the United Nations. They put arrest warrants out uh, for the judges and the and the prosecutor until the issue was withdrawn. Uh, and that I, from my understanding, is is there were even threats made. Uh, against uh, the, the the families uh, yes. and lives of um, Ben Suda uh, is was the yes. judge. Yes, I, I don't remember her first name, but but uh, but her last name is Ben Suda, and her yes. family was sanctioned and threatened. Yes, so um, you know, there, there, I, I I I don't place any credence to that. And one of the reasons I don't place any any credence on these charges is anything more than in in. Uh, instance of geopolitical capture of a UN institution, which unfortunately happens far more often than it should. But um, you know, my full disclosure: my wife is is from Crimea, which which you know is is considered at least according to the U.S. to still be part of Ukraine, and we have family all over East Ukraine, and there are some five million Ukrainians living uh, and working, and you know, in Russia. Um, and that is a side of that conflict. The, the fact that there has been a civil conflict in that country since the openly U.S. backed overthrow of the government there uh, in 2014 is is the internal divide in that country. And and again, I know Americans think that through their propaganda bubble of uh, you know the New York Times, the Washington Post. The big the the ancient three networks and and Fox and CNN that they have a better idea what is going on in Ukraine than most Russians do. No, they don't because there are five million Ukrainians living in Russia who tell them all the time on TV, in media, and in person because of of how much families are interrelated on both sides of the border. They know far far more 
uh, about what is happening and has been happening politically in that country, not not only for the last year or two, uh, but, you know, of course, going going back decades. And it is the height of hubris, I think, to think uh, otherwise. Switching switching gears a bit. Uh, recently, over 500 people were killed as a result of the uh, Al Ali Arab hospital bombing in Gaza. And we are seeing this escalation of the of the conflict uh, in occupied Palestine. As I've been listening to President Xi, as I've been listening to President Putin, they have been trying to find a way to, uh, first of all, bring about a ceasefire, and second of all, negotiate a settlement. I listened to Joe Biden talk about peace. But all he really seems to say is we back Israel 100 percent. We'll provide more more uh, more weapons into the region, but we need to have peace. So yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Joe Biden has also said you don't need to be Jewish to be a Zionist. And I think and has said very clearly that he is a Zionist. And, and has said that if Israel did not exist, then the United States would have to create it for to pursue its interests in the Middle East because it it's serves such as a convenient platform uh, for uh, the U.S. projection of power in into the Middle East. Wait a minute, and let um, me throw, let me throw one more in there. Tony Blinken said the last time that he was in the region, he said, "I am not only here as a Secretary of State, I am here as a Jew." So yeah. forget independent uh, thinking. Forget. Uh, uh, being a a neutral arbiter here in a Jewish state, uh, that sounds more like imperialism and neo-colonialism than anything, Mark Schlebota. Yeah, Tony Blinken also, by the way, mentioned that his family were originally from Russia um, and that they left the country, his grandfather, because of pogroms in Russia. Uh, and I'm really interested in the timing of pogroms and his grandfather, because certainly in the distant past, there were pogroms uh, against Jews in Russia, as there were many countries. But within the lifespan of his grandfather, would I, it would make me really seriously question that characterization mm -hmm. and, and make feel he's inflating his his family's political disagreements uh, within the country. But that certainly also says in the current uh, tensions with Russia in Ukraine and the proxy war there that uh, he, he also has a personal ax to grind, as do so many uh, people driving U.S. foreign policy on, on the region, like Victoria Nuland, whose own family is originally from, from Ukraine. Uh, so, um, there, there is, there is that, uh, as well, but, um, uh, Putin, uh, the Russia has already put forward at the UN security council, a resolution, uh, calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, and this was shot down by the U S and Western countries with the U S saying that the resolution could not they couldn't vote for it because it did not criticize Hamas enough, which is obviously the most important thing when you're trying to craft a, a a a ceasefire, right? You know, to to stop people from actively killing each other. Russia and China have been in lockstep on their calls from this. They, to a certain extent, have been trying to be neutral, in the sense that they are refraining from, I think, overt criticism of one side or the other in the interest of attaining that ceasefire. Uh, Brazil, by the way, also put forward a UN Security Council resolution calling at least then for humanitarian ceasefires. And that was actually vetoed uh, by, by the United States uh, and as well as uh, uh, France and the UK in, in lockstep uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, Russia and China uh, have been clear. They, they, while they don't support the tactics of Hamas, they feel that this is just uh, the latest consequence of uh, a long-term policy of a pretense of a peace process, uh, while uh, uh, backed by to the hilt by the U.S. Israel goes about 
its process of of uh, you know what it calls settlers, which is a policy of ethnic cleansing and colonization uh, of you know uh, Palestine. Mm-hmm. Of, of the Palestine. America, of course, does not recognize the state of Palestine. Russia and China both do. Um, and they think, they've made it clear that this is a result of the West, right? The, the world, but most importantly, the West, because they're not doing it, not recognizing the Palestinian state, not granting its sovereignty and its own borders and its right, of course, to defend its own country and borders uh, and people, a right that they extend to Israelis, but not not to Palestinians, uh, because uh, y- you will you will hear from multiple uh, U.S. Uh, uh, politicians and, and uh, political elite uh, that that they don't believe that the Palestinians are a people and to which I would say you really, really need to go visit Gaza or the West Bank then. And Americans also seem to not understand. And I'm not so sure it would make a difference. Maybe it would, mm-hmm. that a third of the Palestinians are actually Christians. I mean, this, <laughs> would, would, would that help their perception, help them get past the inherent Islamophobia uh, involved in the issue? I don't know. But maybe maybe people should point that out to them that it 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 might uh help the situation uh some uh but yeah russia and china have been quite clear net putin has talked to netanyahu he has also of course talked uh to uh uh the uh, palestinian um uh leader uh abbas uh in the west bank and uh you know his government has been in contact with uh hamas uh, and the other political factions in Gaza. He's also been nonstop on the phone with every major Arab and uh, other uh, world leader that uh, is, you know, has interests in this conflict, Iran, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Hezbollah, the like. Um, and uh, he has been trying to do his best towards uh, a, trying to come to some some kind of sane, cessation of hostilities but instead what we get you know obviously from the biden administration from from the eu you know um uh the you know the the western countries in general is they have obviously given a green light to uh israel to uh do a ground operation in gaza uh and israel has demanded you know, of the, it's a, a city of, of some more than 2 million people that has been rightly called the world's largest concentration camp or an open air prison, um, you know, with walls built around it. Um, that um, the, you know, the real solution is, is the recognition uh, of the Palestinian state. And that that's the only way to relieve uh, the pressure uh, of the people uh, in Gaza. One of the things that I found uh, incredibly telling and quite a contrast was as Tony Blinken was on his Middle Eastern tour, talking to U.S. allies, uh, the foreign minister of Iran was on his tour of the region talking to Iranian allies. And well, in fact, let me, let me take a step back. When Trump assassinated Qasem Soleimani, the uh, revered Iranian general, Iran said, we will retaliate. And a lot of people thought that that meant, oh my goodness, well, over the next few days, Iran's going to do something. And Iran didn't do anything. Now we've got Tony Blinken, he was on his trip. Joe Biden was there on his trip. And at the same time, the Iranian foreign minister was talking to Iranian allies. And now the Iranian foreign minister has come out and said, Israel, your time is up. Talk about what an even height, another escalation of this conflict could mean in the region and what it could mean in the world. Yeah, there was uh, an interesting article out uh, yesterday in the Financial Times 
where uh, an anonymous U.S. official acknowledged that as a result of the U.S. and the rest of the West so wholeheartedly backing Israel in this, um, uh, you know, to, to, to the degree that they have. Um, and uh, this obvious this green light for the ground operation, which which is an ethnic a, a ethnic cleansing of Gaza, right, of the Palestinian population. Try, you know, ordering one million people to get out of the way, you know, of, of course, is an impossibility. Where, where would they go? <laughs> is is you know the you know, the most obvious question even if you were able to order a million people at a time you know to leave their houses um but um there there is an alignment of of global sentiment and and uh, forces uh, political forces going on the financial times this us official in the financial times admit laments that as a result of this, that this is incredibly damaging to U.S. influence in, in what the U.S. you know usually likes to call the global South, mm -hmm. where if you think of the West, you think of the rest. And he says they will never listen to us again. I mean, if if they were, mm -hmm. you know, already then right. then we've lost them, right? Not not just the Islamic world, right, but uh, more broadly and. Uh, because of the recent rapprochement uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the normalization of diplomatic relations, you know, thank, I mean, it's thank you, all, China. Yeah, it's brokered by China, and not all peaches and cream. But right. the last week saw the first direct phone call between the president of Iran and the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and they both agreed they like they expressed a common position on what is happening in 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 uh palestine in gaza and is on you know what israel is doing and how unacceptable it is and that is already an amazing geopolitical change like like the world has shifted and i have to constantly you know ask myself is this real right it, that the world has changed so much and there's a, a saying of uh, attributed to Lenin that um, decades pass and nothing changes. Uh, and then at other times in weeks, decades pass, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, decades of change uh, uh, ensue. And, and we're, I think, living in one of those periods, one of those latter periods now where things are changing uh, uh, so fast. Um, and, we women, let, women, 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 because because to, to that point, again, China helped to broker the rapprochement between the Saudis and the Iranians and the United States was in the process of brokering a rapprochement between the Saudis and Israel. Yeah. And then Hamas attacks Israel and the Saudis say, time out, Israel. Uh that conversation we were about to have, let's put that on hold. And uh, because that decade of change has taken place in the matter of a day. Yeah, Saudi Arabia was really looking for, a, 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 under, shall we say, a newly uh, foreign policy mature Mohammed bin Salman, who, who has obviously changed himself a lot in recent years uh, from what he was when he first came you know, into uh, you know, uh, power as as the heir to the ailing king, uh, who was has really been running the country. Um, he he is looking for a multi vector foreign policy with with a minimal amount of of conflict. So he didn't want he wanted to have the foreign policy options with BRICS with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but it doesn't mean that he wanted a complete severance of relations with the United States either. And since the Trump administration, the U S has been pushing very, very hard on their policy of trying to get Arab countries to uh, recognize in Israel and to uh, normalize 
relations, uh, diplomatic relations and others, which would also be tantamount to accepting Israeli occupation of large parts of Palestine and ever increasingly more so. So you can see where the Palestinians uh, probably regarded a normalization deal being uh, pushed by the U.S. between Saudi Arabia and Israel as an existential issue for them. Because as, you know, by many standards, the most important Sunni Islamic country because of its holding uh, not only of, of, you know, world's energy reserves with oil, but also the two holy mosques. Um, the way Saudi Arabia goes, the rest of the Arab, the Sunni Arab world uh, would, would inevitably follow. And that mm -hmm. would end any hope of Arab support uh, uh, for them if this deal went through. It also, by the way, the sweetener is a security guarantee deal with Saudi Arabia which would effectively elevate Saudi Arabia in uh, security technical terms to the status of, of the relationship between the U.S. and Israel, i.e. Uh, preferential deals on weapons systems, access to more advanced military technology, full access to intelligence, training, uh, you know, all, the, all everything that the U.S. provides, you know, now to Israel would also be provided at the same level, the same prices, and and so forth, uh, to more or less to to Saudi Arabia. That mm -hmm. was the sweetener of the deal, and I believe that Hamas's motivation in the it, they they killed civilians. I mean, there's been a lot of I think mm -hmm. obvious you know beheading of babies. That's Kuwaiti incubator baby type disinformation and and tries to demonize any, but. That's not to excuse that that they use terrorist tactics. They killed civilians. On oh, the other and, hand, wait a minute, and don't forget the the Russian killing of babies in the Ukraine hospital, the women's hospital. That wasn't a women's hospital. Yeah, um, that that is, I, I think, uh, a case for the point again for the way the U.S. wages information war, mostly against its own people. Uh, which is is another uh, uh, fascinating uh, and a rabbit hole uh, to go to go down. Uh, but I mean, it's not to say that Israel doesn't routinely kill. I mean, on a, on an right. essentially daily basis, Palestinian civilians, right? Uh, you know, through its process of settling, ethnic well, it, cleansing, political, it, bull repression. it bulldozes villages, yeah, yeah. indiscriminately arrests, yeah. detains uh, people without charge. And basically regularly summarily executes people who resist right. that. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so anyway, I believe that Hamas's primary motivation in launching this attack, right? Mm -hmm. A wasting uh, uh, military resources that they had spent years uh, building in mm -hmm. secret, right? Mm -hmm. Plans that they had. The timing of this tells me that it was to prevent that Saudi-Israeli reproachment uh, deal being pushed by the U.S. from going through because they saw it as an existential for them. And if that was the goal, then it has been successful because as a result of Saudi's you know, disproportionate response uh, to, you know, if they had, if Saudi, if uh, Israel had said, we are going to do a targeted anti-terrorist operation in Gaza against the uh, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad leadership who were responsible for this and the people who carried it out. I think there would have been a very different global reaction to this if instead we didn't have Israel leaders saying that we're going to destroy Gaza, that we're going to wipe Gaza off the face of, Turn of the earth. Turn it to dust. Dust. And that all Palestinians, uh, civilians are the enemy. We heard that from Naftali Bennett. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, would have been a very uh, different situation. And there is, I, I, I think, a much more substantial reaction uh, not only from the usual suspects, right? We, we've we heard that from Hezbollah, right, in southern Lebanon, uh, the the uh, Sufi 
uh, sorry, uh, the Shia uh, organization uh, uh, there um, that uh, is demonized wrongly mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case because it doesn't use terrorist tactics uh, by the U.S. and Israel and r uh, no country in the world really outside the West as, as a terrorist organization. That if Israel goes a ground operation and begins cleansing Gaza, then Hezbollah will open up a second front war on the Israeli north um, and and then there will be a two. Uh, Iran has voiced very similar mm -hmm. that uh, uh, prospects that uh, if the Israeli government's atrocities against the Palestinian people, which as a result right now are uh, approaching 4,000 dead, which, by the way, is almost four times uh, the, the number of people that uh, the uh, Hamas's um, uh, Operation Al-Aqsa flood uh, attacks killed, you know, four times. So mm -hmm. obviously proportionality is not an issue when it comes uh, to Israel. But that Iran uh, would feel the need to intervene. We've heard even further, surprisingly, from the government of Jordan, uh, the king mm -hmm. of Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. Not not called authoritarian, by the way. <laughs> uh, but because he's been, he was ex um, educated in Oxford. I mean, he's largely regarded across the Arab world as as a Western puppet, right? Mm -hmm. As a a uh, a Western aligned Arab leader uh, with a very large Palestinian refugee population and and a people who feel very close to that situation. Jordan has come out and said that if Israel looks set to drive the Palestinians out of Gaza, as they appear to be planning to do, mm -hmm. then Jordan would consider it an act of war, which which I mean, that totally surprised me mm. coming from the modern. Now, a lot of it is probably motivated out of self-interest uh, of the Jordanian king. Uh, if I don't react the way my people want me to, they will overthrow me to, in order to be able to do something. But regardless of, of his personal motivations for it, it is certainly something I did not expect. Um, and if Jordan does so, uh, other countries around will become involved. And then there's the prospect of other countries or, say, Hezbollah as an organization becomes involved, that the U.S. becomes involved. The U.S. has two aircraft carriers, uh, or well, the second one steaming on its way uh, to uh, the Israeli coast right now, uh, as well as a uh, marine uh, amphibious uh, expedition ships with some at least two thousand Marines, uh, and they. Joe Biden has kind of. Uh, I don't know, on some type of idiotic uh, loop reel been saying about Hezbollah and Iran, don't, 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 don't. Uh, even as it shovels, uh, you know, uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars of um, uh, uh, emergency military uh, support, uh, you know, of crucial military supplies into Israel, uh, and, and Biden is calling for $10 billion in military, emergency military or financial aid, sorry, uh, to be transferred as well. And Russia is sitting there. Russia has uh, military bases in Syria, uh, mm -hmm. naval base, uh, several other military bases, where it helped prevent a U.S.-backed uh, jihadi uh, overthrow of the Syrian government there. With the U.S., it must be said, still illegally occupying uh, eastern Syria, uh, east of the river, uh, Syria's uh, oil fields and wheat fields, uh, and Turkey still sitting in northern Syria uh, with 100,000 jihadists uh, still on its payroll. But um, Russia has these military bases in Syria, and it sees the U.S. just down the coast a little bit with two aircraft carriers. And, and Putin has asked the question, what, what are you going to do with those two aircraft carriers? And you know, their, their resulting fleets. Hezbollah, seriously? And, and Putin was obviously expressing that he doesn't believe that. Mm -hmm. So Putin ordered that uh, Russian uh, jet fighters, their more, most modern variants, uh, you know, fifth-gen fighters, will now be patrolling the Black Sea 
uh, uh, the extent of it with Kinjal hypersonic long range missiles that have a range of a thousand kilometers. Mm -hmm. And he very, very directly pointed out that <laughs> fired from the Black Sea, that those missiles can hit US aircraft carriers where they're sitting in the Eastern Mediterranean. And again, <laughs> hypersonic. Hypersonic, yeah. Uh, so very, very hard to, to shoot down, if not impossible. Um, and he he said, uh, you know, this is not a threat. This is a response. Uh, and basically, he is saying, if you attack our, if you attack Syria, and it has to be said that Israel has already bombed Damascus Airport very heavily again, and they've been shelling southern Lebanon. If you attack our military bases in Syria, uh, then we will take out your aircraft carriers. Right. I mean, this is you see where this spiral of escalation is leading. Right. Israel goes into Gaza, Hezbollah, maybe Iran go in. Israel conducts uh, um, uh, uh, cleansing operations in Gaza and Jordan and probably half of the rest of the Arab world join in. They join in and the U.S. joins in. The U.S. attacks Syria as part of this because Iran power projects through Syria Russia has bases in Syria. Russian bases get attacked. Russia attacks the U.S. Boom, we're in World War III in another conflict, right, that is going on simultaneously with ripple effects from the geopolitical tension and the conflict going on in Ukraine. So all of this has me feeling very much as as uh, my grand you know uh, used to say uh, as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking, rocking chairs and i want to reiterate hypersonic missiles that means that joe biden has basically sent two targets for russia to to attack now because russia is not going to just attack no, American I, aircraft carriers no, I, I realize, World War III. No, I it realize is meant that. as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. Right. Which it's a so what is a deterrent that does not deter? Uh that's a good question. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think Russia has seen several red lines be crossed uh in the recent years uh with the US escalation in Ukraine and hasn't responded, which has led numerous White House officials to to say outright we don't believe in Russian red lines. That means that we can keep poking the bear and no matter what they do, they won't respond because they fear a nuclear conflict more than we do. That is, well, it's more than madness. It is the death of mad. It is the death of mutually assured destruction, which takes us back to a, a very early Cold War era that we should all be afraid of just really quickly because we have just about two minutes left and i'm glad you made that point because one whether it's ukraine uh whether it's syria whether it is uh the black sea the united states seems to continue to believe a when when vladimir putin or when xi jinping says something they don't mean it and when they make a commitment they will not honor it and what I have come to see over the years is they don't bluff, they don't play, they don't joke. We got we got a minute. Uh, yeah. Um, so how to mesh that difference between I think demonstrable reality and what the U.S. ruling administration is seeing as um, their politicized reading of their opponents that does not match up with reality that's that's a recipe for disaster really wow well i want to thank my guest mark shloboda mark thank you for joining me today thanks for having me dr leon it's been an honor and a pleasure to be on the show thank you mark big shout out to my producer melody mckinley thank you so much for joining the connecting the dots podcast with me dr wilmer leon this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter, and we don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please follow and subscribe. Leave a review. Share my show. 
follow me on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. I'll see you next time. Until then, treat each day like it's your last because one day you'll be right. I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Peace and blessings. I'm out. <laughs>